good afternoon. We're going to do a couple of songs to start out with, and then uh, we'll be hearing from all sorts of other people. And um, yeah, if Jeremy Corbyn is nearby, then that's, that's good and for a lot of reasons. When Julian met Stella in the embassy In the only room for seven years that he would ever see Guarded by police with cops on every street An unusual situation for the first time you should meet When Julian met Stella, the time they spent Was increasingly within the walls of a little tent where they could have some privacy from the ever-present gaze Under which he was spending all his nights and days When Julian met Stella, there was the chance of grace Perhaps the president would decide to drop the case They had two children beneath the watchful eyes of the Americans and British and all kinds of other spies. When Julian met Stella on Embassy Row, it was before he was abducted and forced to go to Belmarsh Prison without a chance to speak, awaiting the extradition that the USA seeks. When Julian met Stella, the folks at the UN and people all around the world spoke out then. This journalist belongs among the free, not in prison for exposing crimes against humanity. When Julian met Stella. Thank you. We'll do a song about a prison and more relevantly a prisoner behind these prison walls there's a man who's won awards for the work that he has done and all that it affords Such as the knowledge of the horrors Committed in our name They can't stop the message So the messenger gets blamed Behind these prison walls In solitary confinement In a land of rolling hills and royalty other such refinement is someone who is a hero to whistleblowers everywhere who help them tell the world of the crimes of Tony Blair behind these prison walls you will find a mortal man the reason why we know what happened Afghanistan, when the soldiers of the empire, whose sunset long before, were torturing civilians in their terror war, behind these prison walls is a part of WikiLeaks, an eloquent orator. But you won't hear him speak Locked away in silence One who knows too well How those in power act When there's another war to sell Behind these prison walls Is one who stands accused Of exactly what offenses the U.S. has refused to say precisely which or to try to clear the mist or to explain how he's not the same as 
other journalists Behind these prison walls Is a person they deprive Of most of the things in life Keep us all alive A person tortured As we stand prison walls, our very right to be in of what the hell is going on, is the teacup in this storm, with knowledge there is power, for the solution by the crown, a 24 hour a day, indefinite lockdown, these prison walls. Thank you. This is Kamala Emanuel. My name is David Rovix, and it gives me great, great pleasure to you, the man who very, very much Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, the man who I, I'm quite certain would be Prime Minister of the UK if the UK had a free press. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn, and I don't see Jeremy here, but I think he's, he's somewhere nearby. Is, is he somewhere nearby? Is that true? Is this a, is this a false rumor? Or this is something we've heard. Somebody, if somebody, is he, if he's, if he's walking pointing. this way, somebody Someone's tell pointing. me. Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. Yeah, lovely. Yeah, good, good. I know. On the in the movies, you know, on TV, it's always like the guy's waiting right there. Say, now, okay. So we'll just try that again. Introducing to you <laughs> the man who should be. Prime Minister for the United Kingdom, Jeremy Corbyn. Is it on? Hello. Bonjour, Bruxelles. Could I say, first of all, thank you to everyone who's come here today to support Julian Assange and call for his freedom, because it is our voice, it is our voice in this city and in cities all around the world that's so important to be right now in defense of Julian Assange, who is suffering in a maximum security prison in Britain and fighting the legal case against his extradition to the United States. This campaign will be won by our resolution, by our activity, and above all, by our strengthening of support for his campaign all over the world. This rally today is being live streamed in many places around the world, and many will be seeing videos of it. And so, those of us in this square here are united in our determination to see Julian walk free. We also say to people all around the world, think for a moment, think for a moment of why Julian Assange is in prison. Julian is a journalist. Did what journalists should do. He searched for the truth. He searched for the truth about war, about environmental destruction and degradation. He searched for the truth about the um, state-sponsored spying that goes on against political activists in many countries around the world. And he challenged the power that conceals those truths and revealed it all to the world. His crime is not, in my view, a crime. His crime is that he let the world know the bad intentions of many who've taken us into war in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, have bombed, bombed the people of Yemen with weapons supplied from Britain. Those oil companies 
that are in the rush to the Arctic and destroy that pristine environment, the more to make profits out of it as they drag fossil fuels out of the ground. And so many other issues and cases around the world. Julian has told the truth. And so if we allow Julian to be silenced for the rest of his life, it's devastating for him, for Stella, for their children, for his friends, for his family. But it is also a form of censorship on every journalist around the world. It's a form of self-censorship because those that um, are able to speak out about human rights abuses in various places around the world, speak the truth about the corruption of governments, of police, of military, they'll say, well, Julian Assange paid the ultimate price and was silenced and imprisoned. This is looking down the line some years. He could then be in prison on a triple life sentence in the United States in a maximum security prison. The message will be that if you speak out, you put yourself at risk and nobody's going to support you. We're here today to say the very opposite. You speak out, you tell the truth, and we are here to support you in this square, in other cities, and all around the world. And Julian is now being held in Her Majesty's prison, Belmarsh, in southeast London. It is, as it says, a maximum security prison. The conditions in it are awful. They're designed to destroy and intimidate the prisoner that is in there. And Julian has now been there for a long time. And all the demands that he be placed in some sensible place, even if not released, have been fallen on deaf ears. The punishment goes on. The punishment to try to destroy the man. But it's not working because he's not going to be destroyed. He isn't destroyed. And we're not going to allow him to be destroyed. But if you think through, ever since WikiLeaks came out, ever since all those documents came out to such embarrassing London, and there have been a lot of them, and they've gone on for a long time, the number of British and Western European journalists there is actually quite small. There haven't been editorials in the papers all over the world saying that Julian Assange speaks for all of us when he tells the truth. There's been this um, self-denying ordinance of saying nothing. Trappism has taken over, and all they've done is broadly reported the facts. Either he's won his case, or he's lost his case, or he's appealing, or he's not appealing. I want people to speak up, tell us what they think. Do they think it's right? Do they think it's right that Julian Assange should be in prison? Do they think it's right that he's been in solitary confinement? Do they think it's right that he's going through this torture? Do they think it's right that he should be put in an American prison for 175 years? I'm sure they would all say, no, 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 of course it's not right. Well, if it's not right, why aren't you saying so? Why aren't those papers speaking out? Why aren't those journalists speaking out? Because that, to me, is what the important thing is. And so this message from today here in Brussels, and I do pay tribute to those that have organized this event today and organized events all over the world, is very important. Because the message has got to go out. To people in Australia, where Julian was born and grew up and has many friends and support, You've got an election coming up in Australia. 
The issue is not sub judice in Australian courts. It can be raised in the Australian Parliament. Ask every candidate in the Australian election, do you think Julian Assange should be sent to the USA or should he be freed as a heroic free-speaking journalist? Simple question, yes or no? I want them all to say yes and then an Australian government to speak up in support of Julian. In exactly the same way, I say this, to our friends in the United States. The United States has a fascinating modern history. The history of slavery, the history of occupation of the West and all, so, all the great histories of the United States. But it also has another history. The history of those that stood for an organized working class in the 18th and particularly 19th and 20th century, that stood up against the most brutal police repression that Paul Robeson sang about. Those that took part in the freedom marches to bring about the Civil Rights Act, to try and end the legacy of slavery, the racism in the southern states, those brave people that risked all to support Martin Luther King and others to bring that about. And those thousands of very brave Americans that risked all to oppose the Vietnam War, the brutality that went with it, and the use of chemical weapons against the Vietnamese people. That is the tradition of the United States that I'm appealing to, that tradition. So I say to our friends across the water in the United States, say to President Biden, it's in your hands. You are the one who appealed against the decision that Julian should not be sent to the United States on medical grounds. It's your administration that's put that there. Over 70 million people voted for President Biden, the largest ever vote in American history. That would include millions of people who want to see a world of peace and justice who want to see a challenge to the rich and powerful that are disfiguring and destroying our planet and creating such terror and inequality amongst the poorest people all over the world. And so I say to the Democrats in the United States as they go into the midterm elections, and I say to President Biden, think of your own history. Think of your demands for liberty. Think of your demands for free speech. And think of those great American journalists, H.O. Mencken and many others, that spoke up for free speech and spoke up against uh, oppression and silencing. And do the right thing. And Julian gave all of us, helps us in that quest. Today, be strong, be resolute and be powerful. And let's release Julian Assange. Thank you. When I say free, you say Julian. Free, Julian. Free, Julian. When I say free, you say Julian. Free, Julian. free. Julian. When I say free, you say Julian. Free, Julian. free, Julian. free, Julian. free, Julian. free, Julian Assange. So, as David mentioned before, my name's Kamala Emanuel. Um, I'm one of the, the um, MCs today. I'm from Australia, and actually I'm so glad that Jeremy Corbyn asked that question about where are the Australian uh, politicians. As a candidate in the elections, I'm standing for a socialist organisation um, and will be running in this uh, election. And so I want to answer the question, yes, I believe that Julian Assange should be free. Um, uh, and I and I would like to I would like I echo the question to every candidate in Australia who is standing because Australia has a shameful shameful record over these many years um, that both our leading parties the Labor and Liberal parties um, have failed to protect Julian Assange um, uh, has who has been persecuted and tortured. Um, so I'd, it's it's um it's my pleasure to invite to st um, up to the stage next um, if he's here. Uh, to speak, Martin Sonneborn. I'm so sorry. Um, 
so Martin is a German politician and crossbench member of the European Parliament. He's a satirist and he has been a staunch supporter of Julian Assange uh, since the beginning. He's a founder and the federal chairman of Die Partei, um, editor-in-chief of the satirical magazine Titanic from, uh, from 2000 to 2005, um, and he works for the Spiegel Online and ZDF. So I'd like to um, interview, introduce, he's already here, wonderful, Martin Sonneborg. Thanks a lot. I'm not Chicks on Speed, I'm Martin Sonneborg. Um, I want to address three people directly on this day. I have some uh, notes. Um, thanks, Jeremy Corbyn, Prime Minister of Hearts in England. We need uh, such politicians in Germany and in Belgium too. Today I want to address three people directly. Number one, Joe Biden. Mr. Biden, I urge you to free Julian Assange. I am a representative of a small, allegedly satirical party in the European Parliament. I am a pacifist and I'm not corrupt. I know how it means, what it means to be isolated. It's not funny. Julia, and I know you were, well, now you are old enough to realize your mistake and to free Julian Assange. Yeah, please. Um, let, me some, let me say some words about uh, your favorite enemy, Russia, Mr. Biden. Russia is committing war crimes in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin puts Russian journalists in prison if they report about it. Dear Joe Biden, do you have any idea who might have inspired him to act like this? <laughs> Number two, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. It's too small. Ich weiß, wo ich war. Annalena Baerbock. <coughs> Number two, German Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock. You demanded Julian Assange's immediate release in September. Unfortunately, this was two weeks before you became Foreign Minister. After the election, you forgot everything you ever said. Ms. Baerbock, try to remember and free Julian Assange. <laughs> Number three, Priti Patel. You are Home Secretary of Great Britain, or as I call it, Gross Britain. You have been keeping Assange locked up in a high security prison for three years now. This is torture like British food. I urge you and your people to stop what you call cooking immediately and to stop torturing Julian Assange. British people, British people believe you are so merciless. They even say Pretty Patel would unplug your life support to charge your iPhone. I bet the most of, our comp of your compatriots and the asylum seekers you are about to send to Rwanda would love to unplug you. Thanks for your attention. Free Julian Assange now. Thank you, Martin. And, uh here now before you is a band of uh, folks from all over the world who live in Norway and Germany and uh, Chicks on Speed and we'll just have a, a moment to plug everything in and they'll be right with you.
Check, 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 check. Okay, it's working. I can see everyone. It's nice so many came today. We're watching you. I'm just an average girl with an average
Okay. Oh, 
So in a moment, I'm going to introduce to you our next speaker, Dr. Deepa Driver. Um, so if she'd like to make her way, make her way here. Um, but and, and while we're waiting, uh, let's uh, let's uh, use our lungs a bit again. Uh, I heard someone chanting this one before. Um, only one decision, no extradition. Let's give it a go. Only one decision, no extradition. Only one decision. Only one decision. No Only one decision. No Only one decision. No Absolutely, it's really clear, isn't it? And we can all see it. We all know it. There is only one decision. There must not be an extradition of Julian Assange to the U.S. to, to face 175 years in jail. Um, so, our, our next. Any time. Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so our, our next speaker is, is Dr. Deepa Driver, who, um, uh, who has too many things um, to her credit for me to list them all. Uh, but she is an academic and trade unionist. Um, she's a member, uh, she was previously a, a financial regulator in the UK. She's a member of the executive of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers. And on behalf of the Haldane Society uh, and, and the European Association of Lawyers for Democracy and World Human Rights, um, she is a legal observer for them in the case of Julian Assange. And so I'd like to welcome her to the stage and ask you to join me in welcoming her. Hello, Brussels. Thank you so much to all of you who have made it today. It's amazing to see from here the square full of people in support of Julian. And and all the wonderful banners and yellow ribbons, and it, it is just great to see you. Thank you. The reason many of us admire and respect Julian is because WikiLeaks did some amazing things. At the time, when um, you know, we were moving to a world where from print media to technology and you know, reading online, which seems normal today, WikiLeaks allowed us to break through from the few oligopolists who controlled the print media, who told us what we can talk about and what we can think about. WikiLeaks allowed us as allowed the whistleblowers to provide large volumes of data, not like Daniel Ellsberg sitting overnight and photocopying, Xeroxing the, the leaks, but for information to be provided by whistleblowers securely, not just for the security of whistleblowers, but also for the security of the documentation. And that means that WikiLeaks to this day has a 100% record of accuracy. <laughs> WikiLeaks didn't dump data online. They had a range of experts they worked with. People like Stefania Maurizi in Italy, whose words you will hear soon. People like John Sloboda at Iraq Body Count, who told us the true number of deaths in Iraq. People who uh, allowed us, like Andy Worthington, 
to let us know what really happened at Guantanamo, where 789 Muslim men were taken and abducted without due process in the countries from which they were taken, and who were held without charge or trial for over 14 years, for over 20 years in some cases, where children like Omar Khadr, who was 14 and a bit when he was taken to Guantanamo and tortured for over a decade, where the US continued to torture him even after he was set free by trying to you know, make him in the courts go through a process of lawfare so that he did not have restitution for the crimes. People like Khaled al-Masri, the shame of Europe, a German citizen who was abducted on the Macedonian border and rendited by eight CIA agents, sodomized, tortured. And when they realized it was a case of mistaken identity, they didn't let him go. They continued to torture him. When he was dropped back on the Albanian border and sent back to Germany, people didn't believe his story. Who believes that you are picked up and taken away and tortured? His family went back to the Middle East where, because they believed he had abandoned them. And it is only through Julian and WikiLeaks that we know the truth that Mr. El Masri got justice to some extent at the European Court of Human Rights. <laughs> WikiLeaks allowed whistleblowers to talk to the likes of the New York Times, the Guardians, the Washington Posts, who have a phenomenal reach, but whose attention span is quite small. But also to um, journalists in Tunisia, where the information helped spark the Arab Spring, to allow us to know what was happening in Kenya in Daniel Arab Moy's government in terms of corruption, to allow us to know that on the Ivory Coast, Trafigura was dumping toxic waste. So the story of WikiLeaks, if you are an activist who cares about your brother or sister who is in a care home, your uncle or aunt, your parents, if you care about the COVID crisis, if you care about war, if you care about corruption, if you care about the climate, you should care about WikiLeaks. because WikiLeaks allowed us to do something we didn't do before. Instead of the state surveilling us, we surveilled the state. And this is why Julian is important. He allowed us to give names to the dead. The, those of you who have seen the collateral murder video, collateralmurder.wikileaks.org has the video, you will see war crimes being committed in plain sight. An innocent civilian who was a good Samaritan trying to pick up men who were shot down, being gunned down to death. It is for the justice for Dua and Sajad whose father was killed in the collateral murder video, for people like those that we stand here today. We care about Julian, but we also care about press freedom, human rights, and democracy. We care about the rights we have to know the crimes that our governments are committing with our money in our name, shamelessly. We shouldn't be having the Honorable Sir Tony Blair. We, sh we shouldn't be having Julian Assange sitting in Belmarsh Maximum Security Prison. The criminals are in the wrong place. I have attended 
all the administ almost all the administrative hearings and the extradition hearings as an observer on behalf of the Haldane Society of Socialist Lawyers, and I speak in a personal capacity from those observations. It is not normal to have the extraditing state, the US, known to have conspired to murder the defendant. It is not normal for the extraditing state to have surveilled the embassy where Julian was and to have heard all his privileged legal conversations, which prevents him from having a fair trial either in Britain or in the US. It is not normal for us to allow an extradition process where the chief witness for the FBI is a known convicted serial pedophile and fraudster who admits to fabricating his testimony in exchange for a bribe from the FBI. This is not normal process. This is not justice. The rule of law is intended to hold politicians and the executive to account. In Britain, the rule of law is not working. We have judges who are staying silent right now. My appeal to judges and lawyers is to speak up. Because if not, we have a very clear memory of those who said we are only doing this as a job and who were complicit in serious and grave torture. It is not normal for international law to be ignored in this way, for the UN to find that Julian has been arbitrarily detained and for Britain and Sweden to ignore it. It is not normal for the UN special rapporteur, the great Niels Meltzer, to find that Julian has been tortured, and for Britain to not even investigate it. It is not normal for the second superseding indictment in the case to be delivered halfway through the trial, and for new charges to be brought whenever they like, and for a journalist to be expected to be sent to the US to face 175 years stuck in a hellhole where he will be allowed to die. This is not normal. He should not be extradited. Julian is a hero. It is our time to assert our power because if we do not claim this power, they will not speak up. It is your time, and I'm so glad you are here and speaking up to free Assange. Thank you for your solidarity. Please stay strong. Please speak to other people. Please put pressure on people like Priti Patel and Boris Johnson who may not listen to reason, but who care about the sound from the streets. Gareth Pierce always says that the fight is 50% in, in court, but 50% in the court of public opinion. And we know what that opinion is. Free Assange! Thank you. Julian is a hero. Free Julian Assange. Julian is a hero. Free Julian Assange. Julian is a hero. Free Julian Assange. So I'm very pleased to be able to invite our, our next speaker. Um, uh, and our next speaker is Mick Wallace. He's an Irish politician, a member of the European Parliament um, and uh, for the South constituency. Um, and he is a, a member of the, the left in the European Parliament and, um, and of the um, Independence for Change. So please welcome Mick Wallace. We'll give him a moment to get up here. <laughs> Hello, how's it going? I hope, I hope my Irish accent is not too much for you. Anyway, um, it's great to see you here. 
But unfortunately, not enough people realize what's at stake. The idea that Julian Assange will have to spend 10 years for the best part locked up in one form or another because he told the truth and he exposed the crimes of the US war machine. I think if I'd been told that 30 years ago, I probably wouldn't have believed it was going to happen. But if, you're, if you had the, the misfortune or otherwise of being in the European Parliament and you listen to the, all the talk and the, the, the care that they have for human rights and for press freedom and God knows what. But you just could not help but be struck by the level of hypocrisy that it entails. There's not a word about Julian Assange in there. We've had, we've, at this stage, since I went in there two, three years ago, I think we've had six resolutions on Hong Kong where not one protester has been killed yet. We haven't managed to have one on Julian Assange. They don't want to mention his name because he's the one who exposed them for what they are. But what's happening to Julian Assange is happening all over the place right now. And it's probably been emphasized more by the latest trouble in Ukraine, where the mainstream media have used the opportunity as an occasion where they can once and for all silence the dissenting voice. You are not supposed to think different. This is how you think, and if you think otherwise, you have a problem. And if you think otherwise, and if you have the audacity to say it, they'll hound you until they silence you. We're living in dangerous times. I have not seen it, and I'm around longer than I look even. I'm 66, and I haven't seen it as this bad in my lifetime, where it is becoming difficult to actually say what you think. And you probably have better things to be doing than following the voting process in the European Parliament, especially in the last four or five months. The amount of people who I know think different and are scared to vote as they would like to vote because of the pressure and the antagonizing they get from their own media in their own member state. It's not just in Ireland. It's not just in all, it's in all 27 member states. But we're hearing about it as well in places like Latin America and the States where the dissenting vice is becoming more under threat. But Julian Assange is a wonderful role model for us all. And what he's gone through to protect the opportunity to tell the truth and to challenge the terrible way things are done and often in our name. We need to rally more behind Julian Assange. If Julian Assange, if we cannot defend his case, it will be very difficult to defend anyone else's. I have no intention of lecturing you about how the system works and what's really going on in the world today. But the manner in which the EU member states and other European states have fallen in line behind the US NATO agenda of late is scary. And I'd, all I'd say to you is you wouldn't be here if you didn't know that something was amiss and something was wrong. And you wouldn't be here if you didn't realize that the manner in which Julian Assange has been treated is just too bad. 
And all I can say is, the next time you come to a protest in the name of Julian Assange, bring your friend so that there's twice as many of us the next day. Thank you. There are so many governments around the world and so many other powerful entities that uh, don't support Julian Assange and don't support the freedom of the press, but uh, I will now introduce a representative of an organization that has been very consistently supportive of Julian Assange and freedom of the press, Ernest Sagaga from International Federation of Journalists. Hero Brussels. <laughs> Friends, thank you very much for being here, for showing your support to Julian Assange and uh, your solidarity with him. To the question or the call earlier on for all journalists to speak up, I am here on behalf of hundreds of release of Julian Assange. Now, his case is a tragedy, a tragedy for him and for his family. For all these years he's been away, first holed up in a, an embassy in London and uh, now in a prison cell away from his loved ones. But it is much more for what he's being accused of and for which he's being sought in the U.S., if indeed that proceeds, it will have a chilling effect on journalism as a whole. Friends, journalism, of course, is about reporting on, on issues of public interest. But it depends on the ability of journalists to receive information from their sources, who need to be reassured and protected from arbitrary reprisals for having shared that information in the public interest. And Julian Assange case is no exception. In fact, I, I would like to quote the leader of our affiliate in the UK in Ireland, uh, Michelle Stone Street, who said that, uh, the quote, Julian Assange is prosecuted for actions that are commonplace for journalists the world over. End of quote. Now, there is no shred of evidence that the revelations by WikiLeaks have put anybody in harm's way or have compromised any country's national security. Now, I know we here and, and elsewhere, we may feel it is too late. It is five to midnight. But I think there is hope. And I want to be a journalist here and apply the fairness I deal with governments all over the world every single day. And I'm here to tell you that we are, ha we are having to deal with two great democracies, the UK and the US, which, apart from the occasional partisan political scaradagri, have been actually in the corner for press freedom. And I want to urge them to look very carefully are the consequences that any extradition of General Assange may have. Because tomorrow, they may have no moral ground to criticize other governments less democratic when they intimidate, when they harass, and when they jail journalists for politically motivated charges. And so, I want to tell you not to give up. There is still a wind of opportunity. We still can win. We still can get Julian Assange free and back to his family 
and his colleagues. Thank you very much. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Bonjour. My name is Jeremiah Day. I have a strange and special role today in the program. Um, several speakers have mentioned that in an event like this, you actually have a kind of an important role. And uh, it's quite common for performers before they go on to do some kind of warm up. However, Chicks on Speed also like for the public to do a warm up. So I'm going to offer a very short little warm up for everyone as a kind of something just to get a little bit into it. All right, yeah, we can start like that. That's nice. That's nice. Nice. And we take, two, take our two hands and we put them together. We just make them a little warm. You can do it too, even though if you have a camera there, I see you. Yes, that's right. You, my young lady friend there. Come on. All right. And then there's, you can rub this little spot between the thumb and the rest of the hand. It's good for the immune system, even though Corona is somehow over already. Okay. And then we're going to take the two hands and we'll put them right underneath our belly button. And we'll make a circle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Change hands, change directions. One, two, three, four. You in the back too. Five, six, seven, eight. Inside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Outside. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. In the back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Other side back there. Okay. And then we're going to reach and try and get an apple. The up ones that are up the top, the tallest ones are the best ones. Up, up, up. And another one. Oh, that's a good one. That's from Simone Forti. We'll take the apple one. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, yeah, excellent. Okay, and then we're going to do one, for, for, for time's sake, we're on a tight program. We're going to do one Qigong exercise. And the Qigong exercises supposedly have a kind of psychological effect. So we could either do one to get rid of anxiety, one to get rid of ambivalence, so that helps make decisions, or one which I previously would have said was to get rid of detachment, but then someone said that clearly was wrong because it couldn't be that. It's in fact to produce detachment. So we can do it and then decide later. That one's a little bit longer, so it depends how much appetite we have. Um, maybe you could, could you help us pick anxiety, ambivalence, or detachment? What should we work on now? Ambivalence, okay, ambivalence. Crucial for making decisions, also good for artists. So we have to get a little bit wide in our stance. First, just the legs part, so bend the knees. The weights right now is like 50-50. We're gonna go 75, 25, and up, and down. And up, and down. And the arm swings out. Inhale, up, and down. Inhale. Inhale. And it's bringing all of the energy onto the center line. So you can imagine it's like a knife dropping. Okay, I taught it to someone who then taught it to someone else who then taught it back to me with a funny variation. So we'll do the variation version too because we have enough time for that. So it's a little bit different. We step in. And we make a loud sound. Ha! Ha! Straight down. Ha! Ha! Two more. Ha! Ha! Excellent. So if you really want to use it to make a decision, don't do it like 10 times. You just do it three or four times on each side, and then that gathers the focus. OK, thank you. I also have, um, I have, I have two songs. I've got two songs for Julian Assange. I've got two songs, cause his nights are too long. I've got one song for the DNC cheating of Bernie. 
And another song for how rigged elections affect me and my family. I got another song for every dead journalist who worked for Reuters who was Iraqi. And another song for my fear that their ghosts might actually haunt me. And that's why we've got two songs for Julian and Assange. It takes two songs, cause I'm afraid one might not. It takes two songs, cause his nights are too long. It takes two songs, cause I think one's not gonna be enough. It takes two songs, cause one can't tell his story alone. It takes two songs, that's song because the night.
So the, the next speaker that I'm, I'm pleased to invite to the stage is Annie Matten. She was a former um, MI5 officer. She resigned in the 1990s from her position with British Intelligence Service um, in order to denounce as a whistleblower uh, the crimes and incompetence of the agency. And since then, she's been forced to leave the country. Uh, she lives in exile across Europe, and she has told her story in an autobiographical book, Spies, Lies and Whistleblowers, MI5, MI6 and the Shaler Affair, um, I, I think it's, it's people like um, Annie who, um, who understand what it is to be a whistleblower. Please welcome her. Bonjour Brussels. And um, it's so good to see such a good turnout in support of Julian Assange. As mentioned, I um, started my working life as an intelligence officer for the UK's domestic security service, otherwise known as MI5 before resigning to blow the whistle. And that was quite a traumatic and long drawn out experience. When I had the pleasure um, and the honor of meeting Julian Assange and first hearing about the WikiLeaks media model way back in 2009, I remember saying to him at the time, I wish you had existed a decade before because you could potentially have saved um, other whistleblowers um, far sooner. So I've always seen that his revolutionary high-tech publishing model actually is there primarily to protect potential future whistleblowers and used to protect future whistleblowers and we need them in order to find out about the crimes of corporations the crimes of governments and the crimes of the spies so um, it's my honor here to talk here today about this um, when I mentioned the whistleblowing story this was way back in the 1990s when I was recruited to work against uh, terrorist targets primarily the provisional IRA. There I met, within MI5, a man who became my former partner and former colleague, a man called David Shaler, who became a very notorious whistleblower way back in the late 1990s. We resigned to blow the whistle on a whole series of spy crimes and incompetence. This included not only um, files held on many government politicians, um, and also Mr. Corbyn spoke here earlier, there was a file on him, um, but also illegal um, operations, illegal phone taps, mistakes that were made that could have prevented bombs going off on British streets put down by the provisional IRA, and then MI5 covered up those mistakes and lied to government. And it culminated with um, an illegal telephone tap on a very high-profile left-wing journalist, uh, two innocent Palestinian students going to prison for an attack they did not commit on London streets, and both of them went to prison for 15 years. And finally, and most egregiously, there was an illegal assassination attempt against Colonel Gaddafi of Libya back in 1996, which was organized and funded by MI6, which is the external intelligence agency in the UK. Most people know them as the James Bonds of British intelligence. Now, we tried to change things on the inside, but we couldn't, we were told to just follow orders. So we decided to go public and go to the media. David took proof of what he was um, caused a blockage because it meant that when the police, it was very frustrating working with the mainstream media because um, particularly when he was put on trial inevitably for a breach of what was known as the Official Secrets Act, he was allowed no legal defense. And the press was not allowed to cover what was being said in the courtroom. So fast forward to my meeting with Julian Assange in 2009, and as I said, we wished that the WikiLeaks model had existed way back in 1999, because then the proof would have been out there, David would have been more protected, and um, justice may have been seen to have been done. I mentioned the old whistleblowing case because of the lessons I learned during that time, most particularly how the mainstream media, the old media, can be and is controlled very tightly by the intelligence agencies and by government, particularly in the UK. 
there is something called the soft power, where the journalists are brought into the magic, charmed, secret circle, and they then break the stories the spies want them to break. But there's also the hard power, a whole raft of different legislation, different laws that can be used against journalists. And these are actually being tightened up at the moment within the UK itself. They are going to pull together a new version of the Official Secrets Act, which they are going to call the Espionage Act, and um, will put journalists in prison for up to 14 years, purely for reporting the crimes of government, spies, and the military. So having a model like WikiLeaks, having that as an alternative to go to as a whistleblower, protects the potential whistleblower, and it allows them to thrive, and it allows all of we, the fellow citizens, to know what is going wrong within very secretive organizations, so that reforms can be made, and laws can be tightened up, and there can be greater accountability, and transparency, and greater justice. And over the last 20 years, particularly with the illegal war in Iraq, with the illegal invasion of Libya, with what happened in Syria, and also what's going on in Ukraine now, we have never had a greater need for more openness and more transparency and more justice so that we, the people, know what is going on and we can take steps to pressurize our governments or vote in new governments to try and rectify these sort of war crimes. And that's what we need to do. One final point I would like to make is about press freedom because at the moment, Julian Assange is suffering terribly. He's been literally tortured in a high security pr prison called Belmarsh in London. And if he is taken off to the US, he is, as you've heard already today, facing potentially 175 years in prison, purely for doing the job as an award-winning journalist and as a high-tech publisher who protects his sources. This is unconscionable, it is disgusting, and it should not happen in a notional Western democracy. So shame on the UK government for allowing this to go ahead. Shame on the UK legal system for allowing this to go ahead. Also, there is another case I do just want to raise finally, and this, I don't know how many of you remember, during the height of the Russiagate scare, um, after Donald Trump was elected way back in 2016, there was something that was called the dirty dossier about Donald Trump's alleged sexual misconduct in Moscow. And that dirty dossier was pulled together by a former MI6 James Bond type of intelligence officer called Christopher Steele. And this was used for political reasons in the USA. Now, whatever the rights or wrongs of this alleged misbehavior in Moscow, the point is the man who published it, the MI6 officer Christopher Steele, then was sued by some Russian oligarchs who were implicated in this dossier in the US courts. And this former MI6 officer, a British man living in Britain, was actually accorded First Amendment rights by the judge that heard the case in America. And the First Amendment is basically the freedom of speech and also protects the freedom of the press. So this protection has been legally granted and is part of American case law and it has been illegally given to a British former spy um, who created what appears to be a, a, a lot of allegations about um, the former president, and he has been given legal protection. This protection has been specifically ruled out if Assange is going to be extradited to the USA, even though he is an Australian journalist currently in the UK, but he's not being accorded the same rights. Now, if the law is not applied evenly to one and all, then the law is an ass. And we need to stand up and fight for Julian Assange's freedom, but also Julian Assange's protection as a journalist and Julian Assange's, Assange's protection as an award-winning, high-tech publishing visionary who has very humanely tried to protect whistleblowers going forward into the future. So all I can say is, I salute the man. I think he is an amazing person. He's a lovely guy, he's very funny, he's ferociously bright, but also he has actually done all of us a service. We the citizens who need to know what is do going on behind the scenes. We the citizens who need to know what the government is doing in our name. And we the citizens who need to know about corporate corruption and war crimes. So all I can say is 
the very best of luck, Mr. Assange, and I hope that some form of British justice will prevail, be it the Home Secretary or the Prime Minister, or even potentially the European Court of Justice, to allow this very brave, very wonderful and very warm man to go free and to rebuild his life. And thank you very much for all your support coming here today. Thank you. to leave the country, and it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce a man who asked the FBI to leave their country. Well, it's good to see you all here in Brussels, but I also greet the thousands and the tens of thousands who are following this rally throughout the world. Now, I think it is important to understand that the tyrants, oppressive authority, they want the world to know about the fate of the Nelson Mandela's. They wanted South Africa to know all about Robben Island. And in Turkey, the Turkish authorities want the Kurds to know all about Imrali Island, where Abdullah Öcalan has been kept in isolation for 23 years. They want the world to know about this, and they want the world to know about the fate of Julian Assange in Belmars. Because they want us to learn a lesson. They want us to receive the warning. But there is a limit. There is a limit when the wave of protest rises to the extent that it becomes out of control. Then tables are turned. Then the oppressor gets afraid. And this is what is happening now, and we are witnessing here in Belgium, in Brussels, and throughout the world, that the wave of protest and the demands for the release of Julian Assange is rising, and in the end, he will be freed, of course. And I want to tell you a little story about my own life. I started my working life as a journalist on Icelandic state television. I started in the late 1970s and worked there until the close of the 80s. At that time, we received film footage of events abroad by flight. We got the films sent to Iceland twice a week. And when the footage received, we received it, it was out of date. The train crash in Spain, nobody died. It was no news. And the OPEC meeting, also happening that day, no decision was made on the price of oil. But what we could do with the film material is to use it as footage for our analysis. And what we would do, we would read articles, periodicals, books. We would plow through this to get information to throw light on the events and developments. Now, in the middle of the 1980s, all this changed. Now the satellites could provide us with news of recent events, if not direct. And then the train crash in Spain and the OPEC meeting was on our screens. 
not because they were important news, but they were fast news. And those who could provide fast news, news from today, the last hour, they also gained control over us. Now, what has happened since is that the concentration of control has increased. There are fewer providers, and also in the world of social media, which many of us believed would set us free, the contracts there are getting more concentrated and they are getting fewer. These owners of the media, of the providers, are now working hand in hand with state power preventing what they call disorder, fake news. And there is a lot of fake news around. Fake news is a reality. But the problem is to find out who is faking and who is telling the truth. We, for instance, we know that during the war, we receive a lot of news. There is a lot of time around, and gradually it dawns upon us that it is the state or states and corporate power, those who own and control the media, who are doing much of the faking. This, of course, is nothing new. More than 2,000 years ago, the Roman philosopher and statesman Cicero said that in times of war, the law was inter arma enim silent leges. And we might add, so does the truth. Also, truth is silent. George Bush Jr. may not have been nor Dick Cheney, Rumsfeld, Bolton, or Condoleezza Rice, terrorism. This enabled them to do things which hitherto were not possible. Enact law on home security, have their Guantanamos and spy on all those who were seen to be a terrorist threat. We are at war. Across the Atlantic in Russia, Vladimir Putin was thrilled as he was fighting what he called the terrorist threat in Chechnya and elsewhere in the vast lands of Russia at the time. He said he was at one with George Jr. and wanted to join NATO. But soon NATO became busy invading Afghanistan and then Iraq was invaded, and later came regime change and attempts at regime change in other countries. And furthermore, we not only had Guantanamo, but also the mentality of Guantanamo, namely silencing critical voices and critical information which was seen to disturb the global war on terrorism. Because remember, in war, the law must be subdued, silenced. And gradually, the entire globe was in fact silenced. Not entirely, but to a very significant degree. It is into this world Julian Assange steps towards the close of the first decade of this century with the establishment of WikiLeaks. He steps into a world which is being increasingly subjected to an ever more powerful torrent of fake news, or no news at all, a silent world fighting a global threat. With WikiLeaks, the silence was broken. And think about it. When WikiLeaks broke the silence, nobody 
contested what it said. Nobody said it was fake. Not even CIA director Pompeo could say that, only that WikiLeaks were saying things that should not be said. And here we come to the crux of the matter. Julian Assange's crime was to tell the truth, break the silence. Julian Assange blew the whistle waking up the world. That was his crime. Not only did he bring us documented news of war crimes in Afghanistan, in Iraq and elsewhere, but he brought to our attention shady deals in the financial world and the irresponsible disposal of hazardous waste in the lands of poor nations. And had it not been for Julian Assange and later those who have carried the WikiLeaks banner, we would not have known at the time of the TISA negotiations, CETA and TTIPs, all those behind the scenes deals where states were giving away democratic rights to corporate power. Right up to this day, WikiLeaks has steadfastly kept on in this tradition. I mentioned Libya and the falsification reports on Syria at the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. And I repeat, never has there been leveled accusations that the information provided by WikiLeaks was wrong, fake, fabricated, never. The documents and reports have only been contested because states and corporate institutions wanted them not to be heard of. They found the whistle of the whistleblowers disturbing. They did not want the world to be woken up. So what to do? The solution is obvious. You break the whistle. You break the whistle. This is why Julian Assange is in prison. He had to be silenced, his whistle blow, broken, and what is more, by breaking his whistle, all whistleblowers would be given a message, would be given a warning. And this is why we are here, to demand that Julian Assange be set free. We do this because he is being seriously mistreated, he is being tortured. And we demand his freedom because he has been deprived of rights that we regard as rights common to all men, namely human rights. And by breaking his whistle, we are being deprived of access to information, to a free press, a freely spoken word, the preconditions of a free society. This is why all around the world, people are standing up in the defense of a man who is being punished for exposing war crimes, for exposing the handing away of democratic rights to corporate power, for exposing fabricated news. We are standing up for a man who is being punished for providing us with the truth. The fate of Julian Assange is our common responsibility, the responsibility of all those who want to stand up for freedom and democracy. This is why we demand that Julian Assange be set free, that he be set free now. Free Julian Assange! Free Julian Assange! Free Julian Assange! Free Julian Assange!
So we have some, so, so many wonderful, wonderful speakers today. Um, and, and I would just echo the comments that were just made that having Julian um, in, in prison uh, is, a, is an example that, we, that the rulers of this world want us to follow. They want us to be afraid. Um, that, but what we should be turning around and saying is it's not Julian Assange who should be in prison, but those who've committed the war crimes. They're the ones who should be on, on trial. They're the ones who should be under attack. So uh, our next speaker today is from the Kurdistan National Conference. Our, our next speaker today is from the Kurdistan National Congress. I'd like you to please put your hands together for Hakan Chifji. Welcome everyone. Greetings from Kurdistan, greetings from Kurdish people. I'm speaking on behalf of the diaspora of the Kurdish community. First of all, I would like to express our support and solidarity to, you, to Julian Assange, who is a person fighting for truth and justice, a person who denied to live a world based on lies by the elite powers, a person who never betrayed the dignity of the truth. Dear friends, as Kurdish people, we have struggled to bring justice to, to Kurdistan and Middle East. The key actor for preventing stability in the region today is the Turkish state and, the, and their allies. Just like Julian Assange, many people who are fighting for truth and justice, they have put in prison in Turkey. Political leaders and truth seekers like Abdullah Jalan, who have been in prison for 23 years, and thousands of political prisoners and 63 journalists are in jail today. As you may have heard, since the 17th of April, with the help of Barzani administration of the Kurdistan region government in Iraq, with hundreds of warplanes, the Turkish state started a new comprehensive attack on Kurdish people and their self-defense forces in South Kurdistan, which is in northern Iraq. Last year, the Turkish army had attacked these regions for months while resorting the use of chemical weapons over 300 times. War crimes by the Turkish state does not only include human genocide, but also ecological genocide. The occupation war once again shows that the Turkish fascist president, Erdogan, is trying to manipulate the international community by claiming that he is working to achieve peace and stability in Ukraine. Unfortunately, the manipulative policy by Erdogan seems to have gained the relative success to silence US, UN, and EU member states and the mainstream media in order to continue his military actions which destabilize the region and the world. This military campaign should stop immediately. Assange has already exposed the true face of the Turkish fascist regime and their allies. The Kurdish people demands immediate release of people like Julian Assange, Abdullah Öcalan, and all uh, journalists and political prisoners. We call the international institutions to stop playing the three monkeys about this injustice. We also call all the international community to react all this injustice and show the reaction like we, we are doing here now. Long live truth and justice. Long live Julian Assange. Thank you, Hakan. Uh, <clears throat> I first met Harry Halpin, uh, at, I think at least over 20 years ago, and he was living in a tree in Scotland, and um, he has uh, since gone on to become a cryptocurrency expert, as well as a friend of press freedom, as well as a friend of Julian Assange's, and uh, he's been involved with starting something called the Assange Dow, which he's going to tell you about momentarily. So, so just everyone, j just in case there's any cryptocurrency people or programmers in the audience, which I, I kind of doubt, but it could be true, I just want to tell a little quick story about Julian Assange uh, and his relationship to cryptocurrency and how inspirational he's been to all of the young people out there. So I, fest I first met Assange in 2009 or 10, a long time ago, at what was called the Chaos Computer Congress, which is Europe's largest hacker meeting. And he was launching WikiLeaks and everyone was excited. And I, and I said, well, you're gonna get in trouble. 
And he said, we're not dissidents. We make tools for dissidents. And I said, I don't think the FBI or CIA are going to make such fine-grained distinctions. And the WikiLeaks folks were like, we don't care. We're going to do it anyways. And that's incredibly brave of them. And I personally, uh, 10 years after that meeting, I visited Julian Assange in the embassy in, of Ecuador, and we discussed what had changed in the last 10 years. Not only how successful WikiLeaks had become, but that this thing that Julian had helped start had really become a social movement, a social movement of young cypherpunks creating new kinds of programs that defend activists, defend militants, defend journalists, and that it's time, given how much trouble Julian is in right now, some of the worst trouble that any human being could ever be in, that's time that all of these young people come back and support Assange. And we saw people wasting money on dumb stuff, to be honest, like, well, not maybe not it's totally dumb, but, you know, they were trying to buy a copy of the Constitution. And some friends, Amir, Silka, other folks, they said, why don't we use the cryptocurrency money not to, to buy an NFT, some weird kind of digital art, and we'll help Julian that way. We can, and, then, and when the money started coming, it started very small, and it became 10 million, and then eventually it became 50 million, with more than half of it coming from China and Asia and the global south. And mostly very small donations of like 200 to 2,000 euros. So what I would say is that if there are any cryptocurrency people in the audience, please get in touch. There's hundreds of cryptocurrency people in Amsterdam right now. Some of them have come down here. We would like to get more cryptocurrency people and programmers involved. And I also want to say that young people, even though are actually very inspired by WikiLeaks, and I think no matter what happens, I think Assange Dow has done one of the most wonderful things, no matter how scammy cryptocurrency is, no matter how people believe it's bad, Back to the matter is when no one else would help Julian Assange, young people from Europe, from South America, and mostly from China threw down 50 million euros to help Julian. I think we should all thank them. And, and then we should all try to help the next, uh, the next thing that we do to help Assange. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jamil El Sadi, and together with Sonia Bongiovanni, founder of the Our Voice movement, we came from Palermo, Italy. Our Voice is an international, cultural, and artistic movement of young people from several parts of the world who denounce social injustice through art, information, and activism. We deal with mafia and related criminal organization, the environment, feminism, and many other topics. We are concerned with human rights, and for this reason, we have decided to define Julian Assange and not to turn ourselves away. <laughs> Julian Assange is a man persecuted by the United States of America and consequently by the deep states of his vassal countries around the world because he put a lie on, a, on all worldwide crimes. Julian Assange has ripped open the veil of lies and rhetoric woven of Western powers, the self-styled exporters of democracy. That's why they want to silence him. He dismantled the American propaganda machine and discovered episodes of corruption, tax fraud, arms trafficking, illegal exploitation of energy resources by industrial giants in developing countries. All these made accessible with a click to anyone interested and in real time. 
not after 30 years when nobody cares anymore. For this reason, for this reason, a real witch hunt against him and his closest collaborators is ongoing for over 10 years. With unprecedented legal persecution, giving him 17 charges for a total of 170 years in prison if extradited overseas, they want to silence him forever. And extradition, not yet certain, but unfortunately getting closer. Basically, a death sentence. There's the will to punish Assange for using a warning to straight Bikid reporters like him. A way to discourage unwary reporters and hackers from publishing or dealing with issues that may touch exposed nerves of power. An exemplary punishment that if it becomes a reality, will set a new gold standard for which any journalist, for which any of you around the world can be persecuted by invoking the case of Assange. And I'm talking because I'm a journalist. And what is a stick? What is, this? What is at stake? It's free information together with the values of truth and justice. Guilty is the United States of America, which with imperialist, criminal, racist, and colonizing policies have destroyed entire countries, violated dozens of international treaties to protect human rights, dug massive graves, burned hundreds of bodies with nitric acid, and have tortured hundreds of people in hideous way. The British forces and NATO allies who took part in the war in Afghanistan, in the massacres of innocent civilians whose existence was never known, are also guilty and complices. All this happened in the years when the presidents of the United States of America were the first, the, Republic, the Republican, George W. Bush, and then the Democrat, Barack Obama. There is no right or left in war, no right or left. When economic, political, and military interests prevail over hundreds of thousands of human lives, not to mention what is happening in Ukraine, where Russia, Europe, and USA are doing their dirty business on civil bodies. The US forces are once again guilty of committing terrible war crimes in six years in Iraq. A total of at least 600,000 Iraqi people were murdered as demonstrated by the thousand documents revealed by WikiLeaks. Defending Julian Assange, defending Julian Assange means defending the rights of freedom of the press, the right of expression, information, and thought established in the Constitution around the world. For example, the 19th article of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights read, everyone, everyone has the right of freedom, have the right to freedom of opinion and expression, including the right not to be harassed for their opinion and the right to seek, receive and, dis and disseminate information and ideas through any medium and regardless of borders. We must, we must prevent the extradition of Junior Assange, ask and demand his immediate release and the drop of all charges, all charges against him. Especially now that the Westminster Magistrates Court in London has formally issued the extradition order, passing the dossier into the hands of Interior Minister Priti Patel. It is important to put political and social pressure on the Interior Minister Priti Patel, on the government of Boris Johnson, on the ECHR, on the, e on the High Court, and on every organ of international law capable of setting a, contradi a contradiction against the arrogant omnipotence of the United States of America.
Assange's case places humanity on the eve of a point of no return before which is necessary to change course before it is too late. I think, I think of the shame we will feel when future generations understand that we had the possibility to stop this destruction, but there was no political will to do so. It is not enough to get together here. It is not enough. We must radically change now. A new collective consciousness must be born. Human humanity must know all we be useless if world leaders continue to govern without putting into practice what we are asking today in this square, in this place. After years of persecution and illegal and inhumane imprisonment, the time has come to put aside the resistance, the excuses, the handless searches of a technical, legal, or bureaucratic foothold in order not to take sides in a sense's favor. Humanity, humanity at least, humanity is counting on us. Future generation will be able to, to prize it, us or denigrate us. We represent the last hope of freedom of expression, information and thought. Assange's case is the sign, is the sign of the brutality of the times. It is the inquisition of the 21st century. It is up to us to choose whatever to be uncomplicized or to rebel or to be rebel. Hi. Sorry for our English. <laughs> My name is Sonia. I come from Italy and I'm the founder of Our Voice Movement. Who wants to extradite Assange, condemn him to 175 years in prison and death, wants to hide the serious crimes against humanity committed by the United States of America and the US and European armed forces. Crimes of yesterday and today, which all humanity has the right to know and report. We demand that European countries are no longer dependent on USA's warlike and imperialist policy, which continues to this day with Joe Biden's government. As an, Italian, as an Italian citizen, I am ashamed of the current Italian government's policy, which in the coming years will provide NATO with 40 billion euros a, a year. All this in violation of the Italian constitution. We want our, country, our countries to exit NATO and to build a European community not based on mere economic and financial interests, but able to be the spokesperson of a true message of union, peace and democracy of all, our, the, all over the world. For us, Julian Assange is a father, a friend, a spokesman of the truth. For this, we demand Julian's release now. What right has the English government to send a man to die? A man whose only crime was telling the truth to the world. Minister Priti Patel, Patel, do not remain seated of the, on the chair of dissent, of the submission to the strong powers, murderous global criminals. Minister Priti Patel, listen to these cries, cries that not only belong to the people of this square, but to entire population, to young people from all over the world. Don't sign for Julian's extradition. We want his liberation and a protection plan for him. We want to tell the responsibles of the crime committed to Julian that whatever happens, we will not stop. We will arm ourselves with art and culture and become millions because 
Your threats don't scare us. There will be 100, 1,000, and 100,000 Julians because you will never chuck freedom of speech. You cannot murder an idea. You cannot erase memory. You will never stop the resistance. Sooner or later, all the walls that hold up your lies will fall, as Julian told us. We are revolting people voices, those people to whom Julian gave back the truth. We will support Stella Morris and Julian Assange forever. Thank you so much. We are our voice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And here we are in Brussels, and we have people who've come from all over Europe. Uh, there are people from Germany, there are people from Switzerland, there are people from Italy, there are people from all over the, the, um, all, all over the continent, um, as well as a small number of us um, Australians. Um, <laughs> so I just, um, I, I'd like to um, invite up Julie, uh, sorry, Yuli Mayachuk. Uh, so Yuli, if you're here, can you give us a wave? Yuli is from uh, Reporters Without Borders. Um, and if she's not, we'll move on. But if she's here, please give us a wave. All right. So we'll, we'll just, um, you know, please let us make you know, yourself known to us if you're here. But our, um, our next, uh, the, the next speaker is going to be um, reading out some, a couple of written statements uh, for us. It's Ewan McCaskill, uh, who's going to be reading a, a couple of statements from people who were not able to be here today. Oh, look, that's my big mistake. I think I've got the wrong person to do this um, introduction. I, I believe that Ernest Sagaga is going to be reading these. Um, so, uh, yeah, Ernest Sagaga, please welcome him up. Okay, I'm going to read the text not from me, but from a colleague, uh, Ewen Makassil. I was a journalist on The Guardian for more than two decades and they won a Pulitzer Prize for my part in the Edward Snowden story. I also covered the WikiLeaks US diplomatic cables leak in 2010. Those cables revealed what the US really thought about other governments around the world. It was embarrassing for the US government, but it was what journalism is about, revealing what governments would prefer to keep hidden, holding power to account, keeping citizens informed. Journalists around the world should be alarmed about what is happening to Julian Assange if he can be extradited, tried and jailed for an act of journalism, then any journalist or publisher around the world, uh, around, around the world regarded by the US as hostile will be vulnerable to extradition. This would be a terrible precedent. The US pursuit of Julian Assange is vindictive. It is intended to act as a deterrent to any future leakers and to journalists, <clears throat> to journalists covering leaks. Anyone who values press freedom should oppose this extradition. Thank you. So I, I would like to welcome up our next speaker, who is Andre Junko. Um, he's a German parliamentarian and member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe. Uh, I'd, I'd like to um, ask you again to, to um, welcome him up with a warm, uh, with a warm welcome. Hello, everybody.
Hello, everybody, dear friends, dear people from Brussels. My name is Andre Hunko. I'm member of the German Parliament and member of the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe. And um, I just was thinking when I, in Germany, yeah, uh, of the German Parliament, uh, when, when, uh, when I entered the Parliament 10 years ago, one of the first things I did was mirroring WikiLeaks because it was under threat and we were asked to mirror it on our web pages. And this was a time when I started to follow what happens with WikiLeaks and of course what happens to Julian Assange. Two and a half years ago, we had a um, hearing in our parliament in Germany. It was one of the best hearings uh, we ever had in that parliament. It was on the case of Julian Assange with John Shipton, with uh, Niels Melzer and uh, others. And my colleagues, Sevem Dadelen and Heike Hensel, visited him in London. And what he asked us was, could you please raise the issue as well in the Council of Europe? And as I member there, I did it. I made a hearing in January 2020 in Strasbourg in the Parliamentary Assembly. And uh, the next day, the Assembly adopted a resolution which is uh, the voice, which is the position of the 46 member states of Europe based on the European Convention on Human Rights. And I just want to, uh, I just want to cite this decision of, where it is? <laughs> I lost it, sorry. Um, it is a very clear call that Julian Assange case can be a precedent for any such case. We, the Parliamentary Assembly of Council of Europe, we follow the call of the Special Rapporteur on torture of UN, Niels Melzer, that Julian Assange has to be released immediately. That is the position of the 46 member states in the Council of Europe. And some weeks later, the Human Rights Commissioner of that organization, based on the human rights in Europe, Dunja Mihatovic, in February 2020, she as well took over this position. And this is important as the Human Rights Commissioner has a special voice in the European Court of Human Rights, rights which is the last hope for Julian Assange, because he knows about this and he asked us for this. So the, in the Council of Europe, there is a clear position. And I think uh, in the end, if he goes to the European Court of Human Rights, he will win. But, but dear friends, dear comrades, we cannot wait so long. It is years now that he is in Belmarsh. We have there, you can see how small his prison cell is. He is ill, so we have to put pressure now and we uh, have to do it uh, in all levels uh, we can do. I ask for the next week in the German parliament, after the decision of the court last week, I ask now what the German parliament's, the German government's uh, position is, and uh, we have to raise it uh, now on every stage. But it's good to know that in the end, probably the European Court on Human Rights will side with Julian Assange. And it's important to know that Britain, they left the European Union, but they didn't leave the Council of Europe and the European Convention on Human Rights. So the decisions of the Court of Strasbourg are binding, binding through international law to Britain. And this is a, um, it's important to know that this is, uh, in the end, uh, uh, the situation. But on the same time, I have to say, we are here in Brussels, 
and the European Union institutions here and the European Parliament, they refused to take a position on Julian Assange uh, one and a half years ago. It is, uh, it is a shame for a European Union which proclaims itself to be based on human rights and on the rule of law. And this is not, not to do with human rights and rule of, of law. <clears throat> Maybe last thought. What Julian Assange did, that he uncovered war crimes, that he uncovered breach of international law in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and other places. And each breach of international law will promote the next breach, maybe from another side. And what we are seeing in these days is a follow, is a consequence of this terrible in international politics. And this makes it so important that Julian Assange has to be free, that he can follow up his work. It's so important for the whole mankind. So let's be strong. Let's make a strong campaign uh, further. Uh, I will do my job as I can do in, in the parliaments and uh, wish you a very nice and very successful struggle in the next weeks and months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Only one solution, no extradition. So, as I mentioned, here we are in Brussels. We've had a, a lot of speakers from around Europe. So far, no Belgians. So I would like to um, uh, let you know that we're inviting Stella up shortly. But first, we've got um, two Belgians to, to speak. Um, so the, the first of whom is Marc Molitor. He's a Belgian journalist working for the, working for the French-speaking broadcasting station RTBF. Um, and, and then we'll be hearing from Lord Van Oost uh, from the Flemish-speaking community. So a big warm welcome to Marc. To both. Un peu de français, des comités, des comités belges de défense d'Assange et puis une intervention en néerlandais de notre ami Lode. Je voudrais dire ici qu'on n'est pas seulement ici pour défendre Assange face à, à la grande puissance qui le poursuit, mais on est aussi ici pour le défendre face à la passivité. La passivité peut être complice de nos gouvernants en Europe et à l'inaction de beaucoup de nos représentants politiques. Ainsi, ainsi qu'à la curieuse discrétion de beaucoup de nos médias qui devraient pourtant être ses alliés naturels. Mais comment comment est-ce qu'une telle inconscience et un tel aveuglement sont-ils possibles Peut-être qu'ils se réveilleront un jour en Belgique, en France, Lorsqu'un journaliste belge ou français sera interpellé dans un pays tiers par une puissance tierce chinoise ou russe pour avoir révélé des choses sur ces pays, alors qu'ils sont de passage en Arménie ou au Cambodge, à ce moment-là, tout le monde se réveillera ici. On verra la classe politique belge, on verra les représentants, et on verra les représentants de, de nos médias se lever comme un seul homme pour protester contre de tels abus. 
ce sont des scénarios hypothétiques que je viens de vous dire, mais c'est exactement ce qui se passe avec Assange. Vous pouvez... Nous avons ici en Belgique, nous avons ici en Belgique, interpellé à plusieurs reprises le gouvernement et tous les partis politiques. Ils se taisent quasiment tous, ils se taisent quasiment tous. Ils ne répondent même pas à nos courriers. Dans d'autres pays européens, comme en Italie ou en France, par exemple, certains parlementaires au moins ont tenté de faire voter des résolutions de soutien à Assange. Elles sont largement rejetées. Comment expliquez-vous cela Est-ce qu'on peut supposer que le silence assourdissant sur Assange, dans les milieux dirigeants de nos démocraties, serait une approbation de son sort À eux de répondre, ce n'est pas à nous de prouver cela. Au contraire, ce sont eux qui doivent démontrer par des actes qu'ils n'approuvent pas en silence ce qui se passe. Le premier constat évident qu'ils pourraient eux-mêmes faire, d'ailleurs, est pourtant enfantin. C'est qu'en tel acharnement d'une grande puissance sur une personne indique bien que l'enjeu doit être essentiel. Ce n'est pas compliqué à comprendre quand même. Mais ne nous trompons pas non plus. Il ne s'agit pas spécifiquement du combat d'un seul journaliste contre une seule grande puissance. Ce sont tous les puissants du monde, particulièrement les plus autoritaires, qui ne peuvent tolérer que les informations les plus importantes pour notre compréhension du monde soient révélées et qui s'accommodent bien de s'exercer par son État sur pratiquement toutes les populations connectées dans le monde. Ces révélations, avec celles des journalistes de Wikileaks, dont Julian Assange, ont même permis aux dirigeants européens, les mêmes dont je viens de parler, comment eux-mêmes étaient personnellement et directement surveillés et écoutés jusque sur leur téléphone portable. Malgré ces inestimables services que nous ont rendus Assange et Snowden, on voit bien que nos dirigeants n'ont pas l'intention de leur manifester la moindre reconnaissance. Mais c'est nous qui devrions peut-être les y contraindre, notamment les rédactions de nos médias, qui ont un rôle essentiel à ce propos. Et où se cachent donc nos éditorialistes, s'il vous plaît Il y a 22 ans, il y a 22 ans, le gouvernement britannique relâchait et renvoyait chez lui le dictateur chilien Augusto Pinochet dont un juge espagnol avait obtenu l'extradition vers l'Espagne. Allons-nous assister bientôt à ce spectacle écœurant du même État britannique extradant Assange enchaîné vers une prison américaine sinistre et inhumaine Nos gouvernements européens, nos parlements, nos partis politiques vont-ils cautionner ce qui est une véritable, et je pèse mes mots, infamie il n'y a pas d'autre mot pour un gouvernement qui extraderait vers un destin ignoble un journaliste pour avoir dit la vérité sur des crimes, alors que le gouvernement de ce même État a libéré et renvoyé chez lui un dictateur sanguinaire responsable d'avoir fait torturer et assassiner des milliers d'opposants à sa dictature. Est-ce que vous pouvez comprendre cela C'est inadmissible Voir des démocraties emprisonner leurs propres journalistes qui ont dit la vérité, mais quelle aubaine pour tous les dictateurs du monde qui se réjouiront sûrement de nous voir faire le job à leur place. Bien sûr, nous savons que le procès de Londres n'est pas fini et qu'il reste des espoirs de l'emporter. Mais nous savons aussi que la décision sera politique d'un gouvernement et de ministres particulièrement répressifs et sensibles aux pressions américaines. Nous avons déjà vu trop de bizarreries et trop de manœuvres étranges, même juridiques, dans ce procès pour nous fier aujourd'hui aux magistrats londoniens. Les autres États européens, leur Parlement, ne peuvent pas s'excuser en disant qu'ils ont confiance dans les procédures d'un État démocratique et ne peuvent pas s'ingérer. Non, ils doivent s'exprimer, ils doivent intervenir et tous les journalistes agir contre une menace mortelle pour eux et pour leurs sources. Je vous remercie.
vrienden van Julian Assange. In ieder geval, dank u om hier vandaag aanwezig te zijn met uw solidariteit. Ik ga hier niet herhalen wat al die andere mensen voor mij al hebben gezegd. Wat ik wel ga doen is een specifieke oproep lanceren naar een deel van het publiek hier, voor zover ze hier nog aanwezig zijn. Namelijk naar de journalisten die hier aanwezig zijn of zouden zijn. Ik heb het dan over de Vlaamse pers, de standaard, het nieuwsblad, de morgen, het laatste nieuws, de tijd, VRT, VTM en alle anderen vandaag. Het gaat, het gaat hier niet alleen over Julian Assange, dit gaat over u. Dit gaat over de toekomst van de vrije journalistiek. Nu, ik weet dat meerdere journalisten reeds lang overtuigd zijn dat ze het wel weten. Julian Assange, we kennen dat wel. Daar verliezen we onze tijd niet aan. Daarom vraag ik heel even uw aandacht voor een man die ook zo dacht tot 2019. Nils Melzer is een Zwitsers activist, expert internationaal recht en sinds 2016 VN speciaal rapporteur over foldering. Tot 2019, dat is nog maar drie jaar geleden, was hij rotsvast overtuigd, net als u, de meeste journalisten, dat hij wel wist hoe het zat met Assange. De Zweden en Britannië, dat zijn solide democratische rechtsstaten, dus daar is niks mis mee. Een jaar lang weigerde ook hij die zaak te bekijken. In 2019 was hij toevallig in Londen en hij dan, omdat die mensen, de advocaat van Assange, zo lang aandrongen, zich zal eens gaan kijken. Nu wil het toeval dat die man, Nils Melzer, dat is een Zwitser, Zwitser academicus, maar die heeft een Zweedse moeder. Die spreekt ook vloeiend Zweeds. En toen heeft Nils Melzer iets gedaan dat geen enkele, geen enkele journalist in het buitenland gedaan heeft. Hij heeft de originele rapporten in het Zweeds gelezen. En hij kon er niet naast kijken. Dit was zonder meer een groteske politieke manipulatie van procedures om Assange jarenlang te blokkeren. Wekenlang weigerde de onderzoeksrechter in Zweden om als te ondervragen. En toen hij dan zei, ik ga vertrekken naar Groot-Brittannië, omdat zijn plannen waren, wachtte zij tot hij vertrokken was om een internationaal aanhoudingsbevel uit te vaardigen, omdat hij zogezegd gerecht wilde ontvluchten. En in Niels Melzer was die rapport, en daar staat duidelijk in, het was wel degelijk de bedoeling om die gerechtelijke procedure te gebruiken om Assange jarenlang te blokkeren. En dat is ook gebeurd. Hij, Niels Melder heeft daarna vijf regeringen, vijf regeringen gecontacteerd als VN-rapporteur. Groot-Brittannië, Zweden, Verenigde Staten, Ecuador, Australië. Al die vijf landen, regeringen, hebben gewoon geweigerd om met hem mee te werken. En daarom heeft die man iets gedaan dat hij mij nog geen enkel dossier over foltering gedaan had tot nu toe. Hij heeft het dossier van Assange in het boek gestoken. En ik vraag aan u, beste journalisten hier aanwezig, u moet mij niet geloven. U moet de beste geloven die hier komen spreken zijn. Maar ik vraag u wel, doe de moeite om dit boek eens te lezen. En vraag u dan af of u nog altijd hetzelfde gedacht hebt over Assange. Het staat er allemaal in. Het is drie uurtjes werk en u kent het dossier volledig. Assange, beste mensen, die heeft gedaan wat jullie nu, journalisten, nu vandaag in Oekraïne doen. Oorlogsmisdaden aangeklaagd. Wel, Assange heeft identiek hetzelfde gedaan in Irak. Dat is zijn echte misdaad. Zijn misdaad is dat hij oorlogsmisdaden heeft aangeklaagd van het verkeerde land. Dat is zijn misdaad. Beste vrienden, ga u, straks gaan jullie allemaal naar huis. Uh, laat het niet zo, dat is allemaal goed dat je hier waart. Maar schrijf mail, whatsapp, whatever, naar de redacties van onze media. Eis, eis, dat zij Assange de aandacht geven die hij verdient. Het is dringend, maar het kan nog altijd.
is for utopia. Utopia is on our minds. There are some words that can be said for the empowerment that each individual has and their responsibility to actually feel secure and that the difference that every action that you do, every action that you make, that that changes the world. In our neighborhoods, in the places we are now, the spaces, communities, our friends, our families, our educators, our youth, and the coming generations, the moments that we have in us, it's right here. It's not in a faraway place, in the distant future, or in some faraway past. This is our utopia.
of our next, this is our U, Co, P, Yeah. So put out your hand and cup your hand and cover the rain and our U, Co, P, Yeah. We've moved into it. We're moving into it. The steps. Movements. The surveillances. The pictures, the places, the words. The truth and the exchange of knowledge. Knowledge sharing. Helping each other. A shoulder. We've moved into utopia. This is our utopia. Thank you so much. Thank you. This song is meant as an introduction to a very courageous and powerful woman, Stella Assange, who is the next speaker right here on stage. Thank you so much for the organizers, for the amazing speakers today, for Brussels, the beautiful city hosting this event. And Stella Assange, you're here? Stella. As the next speaker. Thank you so much for, um, for what you've taken on and yeah, for um, yeah, taking on this amazing role for Julian Assange and for the world. Oh, okay, sorry, I was waiting for you to come here, but yeah, thank you. So still. Stella has her own mic and she's going to take it from here, Stella Assange. While we wait for Stella, I say free, you say Julian, free, Julian, free, Julian. I say free, you say Julian, free. Collateral murder video debunks U.S. version. Victims in Baghdad were not enemy killed in action, but civilians.
can't build a just civilization out of ignorance and lies. If you give up what is uniquely yours as a human being, if you surrender your consciousness, your independence, your sense of what is right and what is wrong, in other words, perhaps without knowing it, you become passive and controlled and able to defend yourself and those you love. We have to educate each other. We have to celebrate those who reveal the truth and denounce those who poison our ability to comprehend the world that we live in. Thank you, everyone. I'm really moved. Thank you for being here. When people ask me how I am, I don't really know how to answer the question. Because most of the time I'm fine. But it's hard. It's a month to the day since Julian and I got married in Belmarsh prison. <sighs> and it was a sweet and happy moment for us amidst all this horror. And if there's something in this exper experience that has become more and more clear and stark, it is how, as much as there is horror, there is humanity, there is sympathy, there is decency, and you cannot lose sight of that. What they're doing to Julian is barbaric, but it awakes, it awakens in normal people, in decent people, people who have a sense of humanity. An imperative need to show their disgust. This will not be tolerated. You know, I grew up in southern Africa and my parents were active in the in the struggle against in the struggle against apartheid. And uh, I remember going to uh, rallies as a child. I went to rallies as a child and I sang liberation songs and I shouted uh, free Nelson Mandela and Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years and I can tell you that 15 years into his imprisonment people thought that maybe he would never be released 
but he was released because decent people in that case came out and they shouted for his freedom. And they said that, they shouted even if they were the only person in the square to shout. And I can tell you that even though Nelson Mandela is uh, portrayed as a unanimously accepted saint, during the time he was imprisoned, many people stood by and said nothing. After he was released, everyone wanted to say that they campaigned for him and they were decent. The fact is, it takes a few decent people to show the way and to show what we stand for because we create the reality around us. When Julian published the collab honored the memory of these people who were killed. When he published the Iraq war logs, the Afghan war logs, he honored the tens of thousands of victims who weren't even recognized. Those publications are not a matter of the past because those crimes remain impugned. The war criminals were never tried. The story of WikiLeaks is simple. A publisher that decided to specialize in the crimes of states. To specialize in torture, in the killing of innocents in wartime. And those publications so angered the superpower of the United States that the United States took revenge. And it came down with the full force, with all means necessary, in order to crush not only man, but to crush what he stands for and that is the public's right to know when states commit crimes. When we defend Julian, when you defend Julian, you're defending not just decency, and not just the memory of all those people who have been killed, but also defending our right to a future where we are free, free to speak about crimes when they're committed by states. What is being do done to Julian is a crime. The law is being abused in order to keep him incarcerated year after year for doing the right thing. Three years in Belmarsh. When will it end? Will it end? We're at the end game. In the United Kingdom, there are still appeals possible, but in the end, this will end up in Europe. That is why I'm here. Europe can free Julian. <laughs> Europe must free Julian because when this ends up in the European Court of Human Rights, Julian's case will create jurisprudence what they're allowed to get away with in the European Court of Human Rights will determine the scope of our, of our right to know information that is in the public interest. 
we're now in a stage where states are far more powerful than they were 10 years ago. The surveillance state is merged with private security interests and corporate in interests and uh, tech giants' interests. And our liberties as normal citizens are incredibly impoverished. All our liberties are tied up in Julian's freedom. I ask you all to keep fighting for Julian. We have to constantly reinvent this fight. We have to show our solidarity. As terrible as what has been done to Julian it is, it is also an opportunity for us to seek out other decent people, other people who believe in something, who believe in our freedoms, and who believe in defending a man who defended all of us. Just before I spoke, I spoke to Julian and I told him that there were people from all over Europe here and there were also people from Brussels and the incredible warmth and care and solidarity of the people here. And it's not just us. It is millions around the world. The other side wants to suggest Otherwise, that is their attack, and it's not true. We're millions of decent people because Julian has touched so many people. He's helped so many victims of war, victims of human rights abuses, and no one will take that away. We will win this fight. We must win this fight. Free Julian Assange.